continue in our study of John chapter 8 this week, uh, the latter part of it. In John 8, 33, we find the words, and they uh, answered or asked the question. And uh, we have to immediately ask the question, who are these responders? Jesus Christ is in the presence uh, teaching and working with the needs of these individuals. In John 8.30, he addressed the Jews who believed. Uh, he challenged them to walk in the word. Uh, he put it in a way that it would demonstrate the evidence of a true salvation. Uh, understand that's a very important concept of Scripture. You know, you could, uh, in a, uh, you know, uh, talk to your spouse in such a way that uh, you say you love them, but you never demonstrate it. If there is not a, a, a visual and a practical observation, someone says, well, I'm a very good Christian, but I don't pray and I don't go to church and I don't read my Bible, then one would question the seriousness of their devotion. So as Jesus is presenting his work, uh, it is by our actions. And when we obey his word, we grow in spiritual knowledge. It is by honoring that when we actually put things into action. And as we grow in spiritual knowledge, we grow in freedom from sin. Because we know many times we've not thought through the process of the godly life. Or we've never taken into full consideration what it means to be Christ-like. And to know that God would have you and I be more and more like Christ. He has told us he will work to that endeavor in directing our lives. And so the, a life that we do, it leads to learning. And learning leads to a sense of liberty. John 8, 37, they likely refers to the unbelieving Jewish leaders that are there. They had opposed Jesus and would oppose him throughout this conversation and in his ministry in the days ahead. But as before, the leaders did not understand the message. And that is the difficulty all of us have before we are Christians. We don't really understand the full indication, the full ramification of being a believer in Jesus Christ or the need. We don't grasp the idea that when God says that we are sinners, the fact is that sin is very invasive and pervasive in our lives. It goes extremely deep. It just we don't grasp it or we don't consider it to that extent. Well, Jesus here is speaking about spiritual freedom, freedom from sin. They were thinking about political freedom, and oftentimes it's easy to get things like that confused. You're presented with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and, and, you're, and God is wishing you to trust Christ and be renewed and be reborn in that spiritual walk with God. You and I may be resisting that and thinking, I'm not ready to live all that the Bible's going to go with. Uh, you know, this or that, I, I'm good enough. And we don't comprehend where God is coming from. And we don't understand that, that what Jesus Christ has done by his death on the cross has removed the sting of death. So they claimed that Abraham's descendants had never been in bondage. You know, it's very easy when you're in a position to defend and you can make these broad statements. And they say to Jesus Christ, you know, we're the children of Abraham and we're not in bondage. Christ was talking about the bondage of sin, but they make an outlandish statement because it is obviously and certainly false. We can look to the book of Judges and the records there that the Jews had been enslaved by oppressors on several occasions. They were in bondage then. The northern tribes have been carried away captive by Syria in 722 B.C. Ten whole tribes vanished as a nation. The two southern tribes then themselves went into 70 years of captivity in 586 B.C. 
And even now, the Jews that are there boasting of not being under any bondage are dominated by the empire of Rome. And they hate the empire, and they want freedom from that in bondage. So those who are challenging Jesus, the Jews here, were guilty of being under bondage, but they looked at it from a different light. Jesus explained there was a difference between spiritual freedom and spiritual bondage. And that is where the direction is going. And again, when you and I begin to, if we have the opportunity of presenting the gospel, the physical struggles that people may quickly bring up or consider is not the primary root issue. I may have a problem with some type of addiction. Some type of, well, all of them in a way are addictions. Uh, I want more power. I want more prestige. I want the elevated recognition of academia. Uh, I want this or I want that. But you see, whether it's an addiction to drugs and narcotics or, uh, and uh, alcohol or pornography or uh, whatever, it can be an addiction to spending your money that you don't have or whatever else like that. But you see, until we understand that behind all of that is sin then we find that we don't understand bondage. And you and I, even though it's oftentimes uh, uh, common in the public venue with declarations, we don't understand bondage. We don't understand slavery. And I know there are lots who are saying, well, we are still in the midst of slavery. Believe me, no one alive from this country understands. They can understand perhaps racism but not slavery. And don't ever believe that slavery from 300 years ago was somehow worse than slavery 2,000 years ago. When you are owned, your life is chattel. It's property. The owner can take out a loan on your body to serve, and if he beats you to the extent you die, well, you just destroyed a piece of property. And so we find that you and I are slaves, Christ would have us say. But you see, the matter is whether one is a son or a servant. The servant may live in the house, but he's not part of the family. He cannot be guaranteed a future. He cannot, uh, he can, uh, so how can spiritual slaves of sin be set free? If you and I, and we're given a very, very morbid and tragic picture of being slaves to sin, we're utterly helpless. There is no hope for us. There's none that can do this, none that doeth good. No, not one. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, and we can't escape from it. And God has placed us in a setting where we must realize our utter hopelessness and inability to ever be reconciled with God. We can't do it. I mean, we may like to think we can. You know, we got that old balancing scale there, you know, and we do enough good deeds to outweigh. But what we forget is God says, no, 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 we're doing a counting scale. You commit one sin, you're lost for eternity. And of course, our senses would say, that's not fair. Years ago when I was a teacher, and I would give some assignments. And, I, and once in a while, a student would say, Mr. Grimwood, that's not fair. And then, of course, the most dreaded retort that they remind me of to this day is, I would say, I'm not here to be fair. I don't have to do the work. You do. I don't have to meet my requirements. You do. I've put more than my share of educational time in. Now it's your turn. And in a way, God is not here to be fair. He makes it very clear immediately the soul that sins will die. And as I've said many times, remember, death in the physical sense is the separation of our soul from this body. And death in a spiritual sense 
is the separation of our soul from God. Every individual, when they are born, immediately dead spiritually because their soul cannot be with God. And so we find then that though we are alive physically, the day comes when the soul will be separated from the body, and then we will be ultimately lost in the most horrendous of ways. So how can we be set free? Freedom comes only by the Son, and that's what Jesus is doing here, what He's teaching. How does He do it? He does it through the power of His Word. Note the emphasis on that in John 8, 30. I'm not going to read all of 40, 38 to 47. But 42 and 43, Jesus said to them, If God were your Father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come from myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you're not able to listen to my word. You cannot hear me. Why would we love Jesus if we understood he was from God? It would mean that we've changed. You see, we don't love God in some declarative sense. We believe with our heart, our very being. Number one, we're sinners. We're lost. God is going to judge us. There is no happy ending to this tale at the last moment, unless at the last moment it is repenting of your sin and asking Jesus Christ to forgive you and to, you become uh, and with Him, with the Father. And he says to them, the reason you struggle, the reason you have difficulty listening to me and hearing me, is because you won't listen to my word. You won't listen to what I'm saying. He had already told them in verse 32, the truth will make you free. But what in there, as pilots will struggle with later on, what in the world is truth? Well, truth in this sense is what Jesus is giving. And in the rest of this section, the debate will center around the word Father. And Jesus mints no words. He identified himself with the Father in heaven. And he identified the religious leaders with Satan, the Father from hell. Now, you understand that in today's popular evangelical pulpit, you don't mention hell. And you don't talk about sin. And you don't really say much about Satan other than he's the the guy of bad things. Poor decisions. Unwanted responses. But the Jews claimed Abraham as their father. But you see, already spiritually speaking, their eyes go no higher than a human being. He was the founder, so to speak. the, The beginning of their ancestry of their descent. But Jesus makes a very careful distinction. They were truly of Abraham's seed. That is physical descendants. Cannot deny that. But they were not Abraham's children. That is spiritual descendants because of a personal faith that we read about in Galatians chapter 3. So you can say, I am of the child, a physical child of my father. But there's also, in a sense, a side of the family relationship. It's more than the physical connection. There is a a union, a union connection and a communion connection. Union happened with the physical birth. Communion happens with the relationship between your parents and you. You may come at the end of your life and hear the news, wow, we Dad left the estate of over a million dollars. And you're sitting there with the attorney. And to, to Bill, I leave 100000 And to Sally, I leave 100000 And to Bob, I leave a dollar. What do you mean a dollar? All the other kids got 100000 or more. Well, if you'd have been more listening to your father, you might have got more. And so you see, the Jews could... We are physically the child of Abraham, but no, not far enough. Spiritually, you've got to be a, with your Father in heaven. And you become a child of God. 
Now, notice that Jesus did not say that every lost sinner is a child of the devil, but every lost sinner is certainly a child of wrath and disobedience. You know, it isn't the devil that caused you and I to sin. We are sinners at birth. You know, it doesn't take very long for that little newborn child to tell you he wants his way. And he can't speak, and probably at that age it's very good that they don't because they might learn some vocabulary words very early on to use to mom and dad when you don't give them what they want. And the same way it is here, we disobey, we sin. No matter how we start out, Ephesians, and you we made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Now you know where he's going with this. He's talking about God, his Father, and he's talking about the Pharisees who say, well, it's our father Abraham, but in a sense he's going to be saying to them, ah, but it's not your father God. You're not a child of God. And Jesus said to the Pharisees and any other counterfeit believers, they were the children of the devil. You see, when I say counterfeit believers, understand, I don't know to what extent a recent Gallup poll is correct, but they're estimating that at least 50% of all attenders of evangelical churches today are not believers in Jesus Christ. They may say they are, but there is no evidence and no knowledge and no action in their lives. Now, we shouldn't be surprised at that. I think in so many ways, we've kind of forgotten what the real gospel is like. You know, aren't you sad about the bad things you've done? Oh, yes, I'm sad about the bad things I've done. Well, you're a Christian. No, it doesn't matter. Well, you know, my mom, my mom and dad, uh, they're in the ministry. I was born a Christian. No, sorry. The Jews felt that way. They were born a Jew. Their father Abraham. Therefore, they have an automatic. Christ will tell them no one has an automatic. So we find in 2 Corinthians 4, such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ, and no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. If the worst of the sinners, so to speak, the one who has rebelled and lifted himself up on high, can be the great pretender... Is it any surprise that when we have sinned, that we can't be smaller imitations? You know, he gives his children a false righteousness that can never gain them an entrance into heaven. But I go to church. I read the Bible. You know, I I pray. I even give money to the church. I'm a Christian. I went to catechism. I... uh, You know, I memorize a whole bunch of scriptures. I even prayed every night. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake. Well, if you die unsaved, he's he's going to take your soul. But it's going to end up not where you think. And in Romans we find there, How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? See, if if you've never heard or responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then you pray out to God to answer your prayers, God doesn't hear. Why should he hear? If we're not asking for forgiveness, then we're not asking for anything. So, what were the characteristics of these religious leaders who belonged to the devil? For one thing, they rejected the truth. They denied Jesus Christ who's there. What is his words? I am the truth, the way, and the life. No man can come to God except by me or via me. They're rejecting who Jesus Christ said he is. 
Therefore, they do not know the truth. They tried to kill Jesus because he spoke the truth. They didn't love God. Now, they may have said they do. Lots of people do. But you see, loving God, we are told, is being Christ-like. It is attempting to live like a Christian is expected to live. So we live our own thing, and there are plenty of churches today where you can hear them say, all of your sin is under the blood. You don't have to go to God and confess anything because he already knows in advance. He's forgiven you down the road ahead of time, and there's nothing to fear. It reminded me of a man named Tetzel. I don't know how many of you know that name. Tetzel was an Augustinian monk. And he came in, and they wanted to build a new cathedral. So he goes to Germany, and by commission-based, he begins to sell advanced forgiveness. Or get your loved ones who've died out of purgatory. And if I remember the poem, and before the coin hits the bottom of the cup, up from purgatory your loved ones fly up. Now, I'm not sure if the German really puts it that way, but the point was, if you're going to be out going and getting drunk this weekend and and who knows what else, pay for the cathedral and here you go, your sins are pre-forgiven. Can you imagine if we started doing that? (laughs) We don't even need to worry about tithing. We'd have so many people coming in here and buying pieces of paper saying, you're forgiven. And you would say, no, nobody does that. Yes, they would. There are lots of stupid things people do, and we wonder how, but we do too. So they didn't love God, nor did they understand what he taught. And I can imagine a sense of frustration in 843. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you're not able to listen to my word. Because God's word if the Holy Spirit isn't got a willing heart, is not going to penetrate it. Satan's children may be well versed in their religious traditions. And by the way, there are some amazingly intelligent and capable Bible scholars who thoroughly repudiate the Bible. But they have no understanding of the Word of God, its real intent and meanings. The worst kind of bondage is the kind that the prisoner himself does not recognize. He doesn't realize he's chained to sin. He doesn't realize that he's on a tether that doesn't let him get away from sin. Everything is going fine within his little area. And so we're happy. He thinks he's free, but he's really a slave. The Pharisees wouldn't face truth. Yet it was truth alone that could set them free. The leaders were unable to refute Jesus' statements. And by the way, there are individuals, when you try to give very clear, certifiable facts, when they cannot handle the facts, they will resort to name-calling, personal attack, uh, any sense of reason is denied. So when the reason and the facts failed, they attacked his person. Their attacks were harsh. They were deliberate. The leader's remark in 841 about illegitimate children was a slur on Jesus' own birth and character. After all, Mary was with child before she and Joseph were married. They called Jesus a Samaritan. For a Jew to be called a Samaritan was the grossest of insults. They despised him more than they despised Gentiles. You see, it's easy to look at character and try to find something to hang a hat, but we don't need to look at character. And by the way, as a believer in Jesus Christ, our past doesn't matter. We're forgiven. We've been cleansed. We've been made fresh. So when Satan tries to bring these kinds of statements, don't let it get you discouraged. Be strong. And so within that charge was a direct implication. If he was a Samaritan, he was a a heretic. To be called a demon-possessed person only added further insult 
They were dishonoring him, but he was honoring the Father. They were seeking their own glory. We find in 544, how can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? I've noticed in recent years in archaeology, you go back a hundred years, and boy, every archaeologist was confident. You go back 150 years, they were really, really, you know, sure of their findings. Uh, one of the very famous Bible handbooks has got all kinds of archaeological errors in it if you have too old a copy. Because archaeology has come a long way in 100, 150 years. But the problem we find today is not even the average Christian archaeologist wants to put his determinations out on the line. I, I remember hearing and reading of one he said, if I stand up and, and, and link this to the Bible, I put a big target on my back, and they're after me. But they don't want to make anything definite anymore. They don't want to somehow be shot at. So in academia, it's look at my great findings. What does it mean? That's up to you. After all, if you want to know the real facts, elect me. Oh, that is. So Jesus was seeking the glory that belongs to God alone. And he'd warned them that they would die in their sins because of unbelief. He invited them to trust his word and they would never see death. Now again, you see, this is not a physical promise. It's a spiritual promise. When the time comes and the Lord is going to take us home, and we, in a sense, our eyes close, or our, our uh, life is over on this side of the veil, and the next moment as we, in a sense, open our eyes, we're in the glory of heaven. We are spiritually, as our soul is spiritually with God in heaven. Now, we're giving an intermediate body. We don't know exactly what that means, assuming it would be just like when we were at the prime of life, but our final bodies will be even more glorious when the Lord returns. So once again, the leaders lacked the spiritual insight to understand what he was saying. By claiming to be the Lord of death, Jesus was claiming to be God. Only God has a handle on life and death. If they truly honored God, Jesus believed, they should honor him. If Abraham was clearly their father, they should be delighted. Abraham saw Jesus' day and rejoiced. Now, that's one of those buzzwords that when he utters this, immediately there's a reaction. And instead of celebrating, they rejected Jesus and they were determined to kill him. How in the world did Abraham see your day? That is, his life and ministry on earth. God didn't give Abraham some special vision of Jesus' life and ministry. Abraham, by faith, believed what God had said. It was credited to him for righteousness. He trusted. Now, you and I that have, as, have become believers, we have a document that we refer to that gives us, in a sense, uh, black and white uh, and pages, giving us the whole history from the beginning to now, so to speak, and to the end. We know that we're sinners, and we see it replete in the lives of those in the Bible. So our faith is based on sight, the sight of God's Word. But in the Old Testament, your faith was based on faith. Abraham, pack up, move over here, go where I tell you. And ultimately, your family will be like the sands of the sea and the stars of the sky. Now, of course, in that day and time, and even in a lot of cultures today, a large family is desired. In a lot of countries, especially with a lot of boys, they can, you know, live a, a, a good life. And consequently, 
The idea of a family and your, your heritage being spread out and growing appealed to them in that day. <laughs> but for Abraham, who was very likely at this point in his life, somewhat 90, Sarah's what, 75 or whatever, they know by now, guess what they're not having? Children. You kind of get that impression, those of you here that are 70, I would think it's a safe bet to say you're probably not going to have any more children, ladies. And a lot of them would be saying, amen. So we find then Abraham says, okay, I'll go. And God says he was faithful in following my leading. Now the leaders quickly pointed out, Jesus, you're a young guy. You could never have known Abraham, and it's the response to their challenge. You know, it's one of those things, a gotcha moment. Hey, come on, Jesus, you're not even 50 years old. Well, he was barely in his early 30s. So they knew that a statement like 50, no, no coming of gray hair, none of that. But Jesus says in John 8, 58, most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, actually, the words could be translated before Abraham came into being. I am. He's declaring he existed even before Abraham was born. Before Abraham was. Before Abraham was born, I am. Well, what existed before Abraham and before uh, Moses? When he Moses said, who do I say? Tell them, I am sent you. That was not lost on those Jewish leaders. And they clearly understood what he was saying. Because again, Jesus was making himself equal with God. To the religious leaders, this was the sin of blasphemy. It was worthy of death. Again, Jesus was divinely protected, simply walked away. His hour had not yet come. It says he hid himself, but it was an intriguing word, you know, to hide. How do you hide when it says, and he walked among them and left? And yet they could not see him. They could not catch him because it wasn't his time. You know, the most difficult people to win to the Savior are those who don't realize they have a need. They are under the condemnation of God, yet they trust their religion to save them. You know, my good deeds, I was in, born and in, joined the right church or whatever else. But in reality, they're walking in the darkness and they're not following the light of life. They are li- sharing a living death because of their bondage to sin. In spite of their religious ne- deeds, they are dishonoring the Father and the Son. These are the people who crucified Jesus Christ. Jesus called them the children of the devil. Consider with me this morning, is God your father because you've received Jesus Christ in your life? But as many as received them, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Or are you depending on a counterfeit righteousness, a works-based righteousness. Let's be real and open here. If one's righteousness does not come through faith in Jesus Christ, then their father is Satan. Is God your father? If it is, and he is, then heaven is your home. If he's not your father, then hell is your destiny. It is truly a matter of life and death. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if you are a son, then you are an heir of God through Christ. So the question we have to ask today, whose child are you? Shall we close? 
Dear Heavenly Father, I pray for your provision. May the Holy Spirit be our teacher and guide. For those who have truly trusted Jesus Christ, may there be a sense of comfort, a sense of assurance and security. For those who may be uncertain, Father, may be this the time that they surrender their heart to pull aside the barriers uh, of resistance. And even now where they sit, cry out to you in prayer. Acknowledge that they are lost and they are sinners and ask you for forgiveness through the work of Jesus Christ, knowing then that your promise will adopt them, not only forgiving their sins and taking away the penalty of eternal death, but making each of us, Father, an heir and a child who can come into your very presence. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen.